everybody, welcome back to New at LU. I'm Johanna. And I'm Jonas. We'd like to make a very special welcome to all the alumni that are back for homecoming. We are very excited that you're here. How does it feel to see all these new facilities that you never had? Well, don't worry. The prayer chapel is still the same and the rot is still the rot. We're very excited for homecoming and we're gonna to get to the details to you very soon. But we wanna talk about a couple things that you'll wanna make sure that you go to after this fun weekend. OSD has some great opportunities as you build your faith and walk with others. Join 30 for 30 with LU Shepherd's Tim Griffin as we walk through the New Testament for 30 days. This is going to be running every single weekday until November 18th from 7.30 to 8 a.m. Also, don't forget about the CampCom podcast. Our LU Shepherds, along with our CampCom guests, recap the night and answer some of your questions about the service. This podcast comes out every Friday, so feel free to listen to it while you're walking to class, eating some food, or you're at tomorrow's football game. What? What? Help Neighbors in Need Food Drive will be running from Monday until November 15th. If you're able, we do encourage you to donate non-perishable food items at various locations around campus. And we're so grateful to Sodexo for graciously matching up to $2,000 in donations as well. And if you have some talent, unlike someone, coffee house tryouts start next week. Register now before it's too late. The tryouts will be running through October and video submission deadlines are October 23rd. Tonight, we have the School of Music's Savior, a modern oratorio featuring alumni, symphony orchestra, and worship choirs. Plus, Curtains is premiering, Scaramare is finally happening for the first time since COVID, and East Campus is hosting a bonfire. If you want to check out Scaramare after the game, they're offering $8 tickets for all homecoming alumni registrants. And there's tons of homecoming activities happening throughout the weekend, so double check the schedule to make sure you do not miss anything. There's some really fun tailgates tomorrow that you're not going to want to miss. The alumni tailgate is at the outdoor football practice field. It's going to have free food for all homecoming registrants. Plus, we have the Flames Fan Fest in the indoor football practice field. It'll be a great tailgate for the whole family to enjoy, and maybe you can even meet Sparky and the Liberty Cheerleaders. And we have the Freedom Center tailgate. It's going to be right next to gate number one at the stadium. You can register for free and have a great time with friends, games, and food. Well, I'm sure you already know, but just in case, kickoff is at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow. And the gates open at 2 p.m. And if you still need a ticket, don't worry, you can get a discount using the registration code. Well, we're so glad that you're all wearing red and our alumni are back with us. We're so grateful that you're here. To our online friends, we hope that you're wearing red too and cheering with us. And remember, be early, be loud and wear red. And now from today until the clock runs out tomorrow, let's show everyone what Liberty is made of. God has called you to be extraordinary.
Amen. Come on, let's sing this out. He is my faithful father, calling me out of the dark. And I cannot whisper away what he said in the light. And he is my firm foundation, my anchor won't be moved. And storms may collide, but my soul is on fire. His word. Come on, let me hear you sing it. Listen to the sound of power on my lips. Jesus is broken.
make you the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. And Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, see nothing else matters. And nothing in this world will do. Because Jesus, the only center and everything revolves around you Jesus you and Jesus be the center of my life we make you the center Jesus be the center of So to be true.
Great. 
Let's pray together. Father, today we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who died and who rose again. And so we do stand here today and we just simply say, God, you are so great. Great is the faithfulness of God. When we are broken and when we are hurting, when we don't know where to turn, God, we thank you that you're always there, that you're always present, that you're always active in our lives. And God, we are so grateful for that truth. God, bless our time together today. Help us to be encouraged through your word. Help us to grow in our faith, to help us to become more like you in a desperate time where we need it so badly. And God, for that, we give you all the praise and all of the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, go ahead and have a seat. Hey, did you enjoy hearing from Anthony Evans here this morning? So in case you didn't know, so Anthony has got quite a career. He's put out six, I think, six albums. He is, he's actually did, he, he was actually at the, uh, the Hollywood Bowl. You did Beauty and the Beast, right? Is that, he was the beast, and he did that a few years ago. He was also on a TV show called The Voice, in case maybe you mentioned, saw him there. But more important than all of that, he also is a graduate of Liberty University. And so, Anthony, thank you for being here. It's homecoming. It's great to have you back home with us today. Hey, it's exciting. What uh, a great weekend, homecoming weekend. Man, we're going to have a football game tomorrow, which, by the way, we're going to win. And it's going to be a great, great time. But before we uh, keep rolling here this morning, a couple things I want to let you know about. You saw the trailer that is sitting just outside of the Vine Center. It's going to be there through 6 o'clock tonight. Now, we told you the other day we need, like, baby wipes and diapers and, and those kinds of things, bottled water. Listen, you could go out and buy a, a pack of bottled water for about six or seven bucks. Well, let's see, inflation, maybe eight bucks, I don't know. And you can pick that up, and that's going to be out there through 6 o'clock today, and that truck is going to be leaving on Monday, driving down to Fort Myers, Florida, to McGregor Baptist Church there. It's going to be delivering all of those items there, and the Church of Jesus Christ is going to be present and showing up and being the hands and feet of Christ, and we have an opportunity to help encourage them and to bless them. So, man, make sure you go out today. If you've not already done so, uh, just go out sometime today, get those items, come back, drop it off at the truck by 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, also, want to let you know if you're here for homecoming, I know a lot of you are here. we got a lot of you know, former graduates, former students who are going to be coming in. So you can, this QR code that's on the screen, you can actually take a photo of that QR code. It'll give you all the schedule, all the different events that are taking place uh, today and tomorrow throughout the weekend that you'll want to be a part of. And so just make sure we'll leave that up there for just a moment as well so you can catch that. Now listen, you guys know, we've talked about this a little bit this fall, that you know, there's a group of students that sit behind this screen every single convo. And you might not be able to see them, but you can hear from them. Now, we are going to go in the round next spring. We're actually moving the stage out into the middle, so that way nobody will be behind the screen anymore. But today, we're going to hear, not only hear from them, but we're going to see them. We've got a special guest that's actually up there with them. And so let's go up there. I think it might be our president, Dr. Prevo. Thank you. All right. I never get to see this group up here, so I st came up here today. Let's all stand. All these folks back here, stand up. Good. Put them on the screen so the rest of the student body can see them. Great. All right. One of these days, you'll make good enough grades so you can sit out there, all right? Thank you. You may be seated. We've got an important election coming up. Every election's important. How many of you are registered to vote? Raise your hand, would you please? Great. Now, let me slip by you here a little bit. You know, I saw some numbers the other day, and the University of Lynchburg's precinct had more people vote than Liberty's precinct. I think we ought to beat them, don't you? I like contest. How many of you like contest? Yeah. All right, now here's what you need to do. You can register to vote here in Virginia and, uh, and vote here. We're going to have a place in Montview, ballroom for you to vote on election day. But you need to get registered. If you have a Virginia driver's license, you can go online and register. 
If uh, you don't, you can register, I uh, think, where is it, in the ballroom? Do you know where it is, Walter? Yeah, I think it should be in the ballroom. In the ballroom, yes, all right. How would you know that? Uh, I'm, I'm actually running for city council here in the city. Uh oh, of I, I can't promote you, all right? <laughs> I can't promote you, all right. But you need to get registered to vote. And uh, we'd like for you to get that done by the 17th. There'll be a table up here someplace, what do they call it, door one, I think, where they'll be set up so you can go by and register. There'll be places throughout the campus this week. You're a good citizen. God gives us the privilege to live here in a country where we can vote and choose the leadership that we want to have. But more than that, I mean, we need to be a good citizen. But more than that, I'd like to beat the precinct of the University of Lynchburg, all right? I'd like to be able to come back in here and tell you that our precinct here of Liberty University had more people vote than they did. So get registered so you can vote and let's have a, a great turnout and we don't want to get beat. I don't like to lose, do you? No. So let's get registered to vote. Thank you for being here in Convo. We've got a great speaker today. I'm going to ask Pastor Jonathan to come and introduce that speaker. Let's give him a big hand as he comes today. Thank you, brother. So before I introduce our speaker today, I do want to introduce one other group of guests that are here. They're up actually in the box. It's just above the side over here. And that is a group of 75 women from Thomas Road Baptist Church. They're all widows, and they're here today. And they wanted to come and hear Priscilla speak. And so let's just welcome the widows from Thomas Road for being here. So we're excited to have Priscilla Shire here today. She's a New York Times best-selling author. She is a Bible teacher, and probably many of you have walked through some of her Bible studies. She is an incredible woman of God that is being used in incredible ways, not only here in America, but around the world of taking the truth and the power of God's Word to people everywhere. And so we're thrilled to welcome Priscilla Shire to the stage here at Liberty University today. to share with you. I'm just grateful to be able to be in the house today and to be able to experience Convo with you, not only you, but especially all the people that are behind me, behind this screen right here. It's good to be with all of you, and I'm excited to do what I love to do, and that is to share God's Word with you. I believe in the power of the Word of God. I hope you do too. And I'm excited to share a few thoughts with you from the scriptures that I hope will be an encouragement to you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, I pray that for every single brother or sister under the sound of my voice that today they will hear a word straight from your heart for them. Speak, Lord. We are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the reasons why I'm glad to be here, there are many, but one of them is, um, like Pastor Jonathan was saying, uh, my brother graduated from here and now I have two sons that are here, I have two nephews that are here. Um, our family's just sort of entrenched a bit at Liberty University and we love it that way. Um, my, my three sons, there are three of them, two of them here, one of them that is just entering his high school years, Jackson, Jerry Jr., and Jude. And when we were raising them, when they were really small, we raised them at, um, in, in kind of a rural part of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We live in and around Dallas-Fort Worth. And for about a decade, we lived outside of Dallas. It was close enough that we could get to the city really quickly, but it was a rural part of town. So it felt like it was worlds away. You know, somebody had some cows that lived over there and somebody had some horses that were over there. And our neighbor across the street had a pond. Our neighbor, she's been one of my closest friends for about 20 years, the boys call her Aunt Rachel. We would go across the street very frequently to Aunt Rachel's pond. It's a big old pond, y'all. 
We would take fishing poles that I bought on sale at the local super Walmart around the corner. I got a tackle box as well that was on sale that day. Um, and we have things in the tackle box that you need, you know, when you're professional fishermen and women. We had extra bobbers and extra hooks, and um, we had gloves, because you know I don't mind going fishing, but I ain't finna actually touch no fish. <laughs> and then we would get whatever hot dog meat was left over from the week, because you know we're professionals, that was the bait. And then we would walk across the street, me and the three boys, and we would go fishing. Now, most of the time, we would just fish on this little part of the, a, a little cove that was right there at the edge of the pond. There were trees hanging over it, so it was shaded. And so the boys and I would go, and we would fish right there. But every now and then, we'd be feeling really adventurous. My neighbors had this little metal rowboat that they bought on, that they bought on Craigslist, and it was seaworthy. You know, it wasn't a big deal, but it was seaworthy. It would hold us up on the pond, and this was a really big pond. So every now and then, when I was feeling adventurous, we would get in the boat, we would push out a little way, we would row till we got a little distance into the pond, and then we would fish from, from the middle where maybe there were some bigger fish. We did it every now and then. Not often. And the reason why we didn't do it often is because to get in this boat, we were going to have to turn this boat over. When it wasn't in use, they would leave it upside down, as they should, so that if it rained, it didn't fill up with water, or any water that had been sort of collected in it the last time it was out could drain. So it was left, rightfully so, upside down. So the problem is, y'all, to get in this thing, we had to turn it over. And here's what I knew for sure that the environment that had been created underneath this upside-down boat was damp, it was dark, it was the perfect situation for critters to have made themselves at home under this boat. And I knew once we turned it over, something was either going to hop out from underneath this boat, something was going to waddle out from underneath this boat, or worst of all, y'all know, something was going to slither out from underneath this boat. And so every now and then when I was feeling adventurous, I'd say, okay, come on, boys, let's turn it over. And I would, let, I would let them get the sides. I would stand way at the back of this boat, and then we would turn it over, and inevitably something would always come out from underneath that boat. It always dawned on me that never once did I have to write an invitation and send it into the brush nearby and say to the critters, hey, me and the boys will be there at 1 p.m. today, so if you want to come and join us, you're welcome to. Never once did I have to stand on the shoreline and call out to them and say, hey, you, you critters want to come and enjoy this fishing expedition with us? Never once did I have to invite them, because the environment created by the upside-down boat was invitation enough. Upside-down living is living that is out of alignment with the truth of God. Right side up living positions you for the sunlight of God's favor, God's grace, God, God's blessing to be poured out on your life. But when you're living upside down, not only do you not have opportunity to receive God's blessing and favor on your life, but you've also created an environment in your life. I've created an environment in my life when I have upside down attitudes and upside down actions and upside down behaviors that are out of alignment with the truth of God. I've created an environment where the enemy of our souls can come and make himself at home, causing jealousy or a, a lack of peace of mind, of heart, where he stirs up division in relationships and causes angst and anxiety in our relationships and in our own life. And I don't know about y'all, but I want to live right side up so I can have God's favor all over my life. And so it occurs to me that in a group this size, there are very, very many of us that have found ourselves, whether in the past or right now in the present, as you and I are sitting in this room, you recognize that there are times that we're living upside down, where we know doggone good and well that our attitudes or our, our speech and communication or the way we're reacting to other people, we know that it's out of alignment with the truth of God. And I just wanted to encourage any of you that might be recognizing something about yourself right now that you realize is upside down. 
that you know this is not what God has called you to. This is not how he's called you to behave or act or speak or respond or relate to other people. And you just feel like maybe you're too far gone to come back. And I just wanted to remind you and encourage you today that God's grace is sufficient for you. That he himself by his spirit will help you to turn that boat right side up so the sunlight of his favor can be all over your life. His grace is sufficient for you. His patience is perfect towards you. His mercy is extravagant. His love is never end ending. He is slow to anger. Anybody glad he's slow to anger? And he's great in loving kindness. I want to remind you for just a few minutes this morning about the patience of God, how patient he is toward you. The enemy would want you to think, because y'all know we do have an enemy, right? He would want you to think that God is mad at you, that there's no hope. When God speaks, it's the voice of conviction. When the enemy speaks, it's condemnation. Condemnation says that not only what you did is wrong, condem condem condemnation says you are wrong. That there is no hope for turning your boat right side up. That there's no hope for God's favor and grace being experienced by you. I want to remind you of the extravagant grace and love of God towards you that his patience is perfect. His patience, the reason why I wanted to talk about it today is because honestly, it's sometimes one of the most overlooked characteristics of our God. There are so many great characteristics of God. He's sovereign. He's holy. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. His patience Patience sometimes sneaks in there and gets overlooked by some of the bigger theological principles that we celebrate about God. But honestly, I think that in all of the links of the chain that make up the character of our God, the most central and important one is this one, that he is patient and merciful and long-suffering towards us. And the reason why I think it's the central most important part of the chain is because honestly, if he weren't patient towards us, we wouldn't exist long enough to experience the other part of his character. It's because he is patient and long-suffering toward us. Here's the great thing about God. You and I are not powerful enough to wear God out. God doesn't need a good nap before he can handle what's gone on in your past or what's currently going on in your future. We don't have the capacity to wear God out. We are not that great. So I want you to know that there's nothing you've done. There's nothing you've said. There's nowhere you've been. There's nothing you've experienced. There's nothing that's been done to you or that you've done to somebody else. There's no path you've walked, on, walked down. There's no ditch you've dug for yourself. There is no upside down way that you have ever been living, no matter how long you've been living that way, that today is not actually a great day for you to say, Father, help me to turn this boat right side up. Thank you, Father, for your patience and grace towards me. His grace is sufficient. He's got your back. One of the clearest places in scriptures that speaks about the patience of God is in 1 Timothy. If you have your Bible, you know, if you actually still use an, an old school Bible like I do with paper pages, or if you have your iPhone, your iPad, any manner of iness will take you to 1 Timothy chapter 1. One of the clearest places in Scripture, y'all, where he talks about his patience, the patience of God, is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, a young Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. He says, and yet for this reason, this is the Apostle Paul talking, yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost or the chief of all sinners, Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience. Y'all, what kind of patience is it? His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him to eternal life. The Apostle Paul calls the patience of our God perfect, which means even at its furthest extremes, even at, at that which represents the most far capacity, capacity of our God's patience, there is nothing diminished or weak about our God's patience. It cannot be diminished. It cannot run out. His patience towards you is perfect. And just in case 
You're wondering if you're the exception to the rule because you know you know yourself. You, you look in the mirror. You know what you've done. You know what your history entails. You know like I know the paths you've walked down, the relationships you've allowed, the things that have got you hung up sometimes in your heart or in your mind or in your behaviors. You know you. So sometimes when we know ourselves like that, we think we're the exception to the rule, that God's grace might be good enough for that person on this side of me or that side of me or the one who's sitting behind me but not me because you don't know my story. You don't know my testimony. So maybe, possibly, there are a few of you here today who think you might be an exception to the rule. And I think the Apostle Paul knew that, which is why he says, let me be a demonstration for you. And he calls himself the foremost, the chief of all sinners. This is the Apostle Paul basically saying, you ain't done nothing I haven't already done. You haven't been anywhere I haven't already been. You haven't said anything I haven't already said. You've not thought anything, the Apostle Paul is saying, that I haven't already thought. So he's like, just in case you think you're the one that, that is an exception to the rule of the perfect patience of God, he says, I want you to know there is no ditch that you have dug for yourself that is so deep that the arm of God is not so long that he cannot reach in that pit and pull you up out of it. He wants you to know his patience is perfect towards me as the chief of all sinners, which means his patience is also perfect towards you. So he says, listen, the patience of God is great. And he starts that verse with this little phrase, for this reason. It's kind of like the word therefore. Anytime a verse starts with for this reason or starts with the word therefore, you need to go see what it's there for. Because it's there for a reason. It's trying to connect dots with what has already been written before that particular verse. So Paul is trying to connect the dots for us between what he's already said and what he's describing as the perfect patience of God. He's saying God's patience is perfect and I've got some reasons that I've already told you. So I figure for just a few minutes, you, could I, you and I could just skip up a few verses and find out what the reasons were that he described as to why we can be confident that there is always hope for us, always mercy towards us, that the boat that might be upside down right now in our lives doesn't have to stay that way, that there's always an opportunity because our God is so merciful to get that thing right side up so that we can have God's grace poured out on our life. I'm going to show you and I want to look with you at what these reasons are. The first reason is in verse 15. So we're just backtracking up a couple of verses. He says, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Here's the reason. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There it is right there. He says, here's the first reason why you can know for sure that you cannot outpace or outrun the grace and the perfect patience of God. Here's how you can always know there's always hope for you and me, that we're never too far gone to experience the mercy and the goodness and the grace of God. He says, here's the reason he saved you, didn't he? All right. I can tell that y'all aren't excited enough about that, that little reason right there. So here's the thing. Sometimes, maybe if you grew up in church or around church culture all your life, or maybe you didn't, but here you are now at this incredible place where you get to boldly, unashamedly exclaim the name of Jesus Christ. You get to hear about these nuances of salvation and victorious living on a regular basis in your regular everyday life. Sometimes for folks like us, who are so blessed to sort of hear this sort of thing regularly, that every now and then we can begin to hear it and it rolls off our shoulders casually as if it's no big deal. So let's talk for just a second about the fact that you saved. Okay. It's kind of a big deal. Okay. Do you know that it is a miracle that you were born. I mean, physically born. It's a miracle that you were born. There's nothing chance or happenstance. It's not lucky stars that you were born in this day and age, in this generation, that your life was assigned to this point in history, that you're in the skin color that you're in with the hair texture you've got on your head, 
that you happen to be with that personality, with those strengths and those weaknesses, that, that a nuance of the way you operate, the way you relate to other people, the uniqueness of who you are. There ain't nothing chance about that. It's a miracle that you were born that way. I, I'm saying, y'all, it was divine strategy that set you up. That even if your parents were surprised that you showed up, God was not. Okay? He had you planned. Okay, think about this. There are 7 billion, probably closer to 8 billion now, plus people on the planet. Your great-great-grandfather with 8 billion people on the planet, he just happened to cross paths with the woman that would be your great-great-grandmother. The two of them came together and created your great-grandfather. Then your great-grandfather with 8 billion plus people on the planet just happened to find the woman that was your great-grandmother. The two of them came together and created your grandfather. Your grandfather with 8 billion plus people on the planet just happened to find the woman that would be your grandmother. They created your father. And then your father with the 8 billion billion plus people that are on the planet just happened to find the woman that would be your mother. The two of them came together and created you. There's nothing chance about that. That's God orchestrating, maneuvering, aligning, putting the right people in the right place at the right time to make sure you and I showed up in this point in history. It's a miracle that you were born. And if it's a miracle that you're born, how much more of a miracle is it that you were born again? Okay? My father has described this like a divine chessboard. Since the beginning of time, your God has been strategically organizing for your salvation and mine, vying for your allegiance and mine. It's like a cosmic chessboard. The enemy has been on one side. God has been on the other since the very beginning of time, vying for our allegiance and making a way for redemption. God made the first move. He put Adam and Eve, perfect individuals, in a perfect environment, perfect relationship to himself. But the enemy, he made a move. He slithered into their perfect experience. He introduced sin onto the, into the equation. And all of a sudden, sin enters the heart of man and into their experience. And separates their relationship with the one true and living God. And all of a sudden, Cain kills Abel, and now murder has entered the scene, and it looks like all hope is lost. But our God, never to be outdone, he makes another move on the cosmic chessboard. He causes Adam and Eve to come back together again. They have a baby named Seth, and Seth gives birth to Enosh. And I don't know what it was about that brother Enosh, but Genesis chapter 4 says that when Enosh was born, everybody started worshiping God again. But then the enemy made another move. He introduced sin and rebellion into the equation again. And y'all, it proliferated so far and so wide that the entire earth needed to be destroyed by a flood. And it looked like the enemy had won, but our God never to be outdone. He had another move up his sleeve and his name was Noah. And he said, no, I'm going to need you to build me an ark so that you could preserve mankind, humankind. I'm not done with them. I want a relationship with them. And through one man's obedience, humankind was preserved. Then the enemy introduced sin and rebellion again, and it proliferated so much so that it seemed like all hope was lost. But our God, never to be outdone, he made another move. He went to this little pagan town called Ur, and he plucked out of it a man named Abram. And he said, Abram, come on, go with me. I'm going to change not only your name, but I'm also going to change the GPS coordinates on your destiny. I'm going to create a brand new people out of you. They will be mine, and I will be theirs. The enemy made another move. Now he takes God's people, this brand new group of people, and he, they go down into Egypt. They're enslaved for 400 years. It seems like all hope is lost, but then God makes another move, and his name is Moses. And at the right time, he says to Moses, come on, Mo, it's time. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And after 10 miraculous plagues and 40 years wandering in the wilderness, the people of God finally come into the place of God, a land flowing with milk and honey. But y'all, the entire book of Judges is about, is about the people of God in Canaan. 
The enemy introduces idolatry to the people of God. They're still worshiping God, but they're also worshiping the idols of the land. And when God's people live a duplicitous life where they're worshiping God on one side, but they've got idols on the other side, it creates havoc throughout the entire culture. By the time you get to the last line of the book of Judges, the last line says, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Y'all, if that don't sound like this country in the year 2022, I don't know what does. It seemed like all hope was lost, but of course our God, never to be outdone on this cosmic chessboard, he makes another move and her name is Ruth. And you know, Ruth has a rough start, a pretty rough beginning, but at the right time, Ruth meets this guy named Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, and the two of them come together, their lives intersect, and they give birth to a baby boy named Obed. Obed gives birth to Jesse. Jesse gives birth to a guy named David. And with that, with that one move, the enemy didn't even know it, but the checkmate was already on the way. Then the Old Testament closes, y'all. There's 400 years of silence. God is on one side of the cosmic chessboard and the enemy is on the other side. And there's silence for 400 years and all of history, all of humanity is waiting in the balance trying to figure out who's going to make the next move. And then the New Testament opens. And God makes a move the likes of which the enemy still to this day has never had a response. Jesus Christ enters the scene. <laughs> Y'all, this is God basically putting on flesh and saying, you know what, let me go down here and take care of this myself. And he lives a perfect life and he dies a substitutionary death and three days later he gets up out of the grave. He gives us the receipt of the resurrection for our redemption. And with that one move, our salvation is secured. Okay? Why, why would Paul bring up salvation in this passage about the perfect patience of God? Because he wants you to know that if God was patient enough to orchestrate the details of the past few millennia to take care of your salvation, if he was patient enough for that, he is also patient enough to take care of you every single day, every single week, every single month of your life, if he was patient enough to save you, he's patient enough to sustain you. Okay. But he says, y'all, that's not the only reason. He says there's another reason in uh, verse 16, uh, verse 14 rather, actually it's 13. He says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, Formerly. Somebody say formerly. Come on, y'all. It's your testimony. Say formerly. Okay. The Apostle Paul, this is so good. Are y'all ready? Okay. The Apostle Paul, he gives us three things on his sin resume. He didn't tell us any details before. He just said, I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm the worst you've ever seen. Now he gives us three details. He gives us stuff that's on his sin resume. A violent aggressor, a blasphemer, a persecutor of the church. But he says, before you read my resume, please make sure you see the all cap, bold font, underlined subtitle that is at the top of my resume, formerly. This is who I was, but this is not who I am anymore. Because the patience of God is so great that not only does he save you, but he sticks around long enough to change you. He helps you walk different and talk different and maneuver different and relate different and have different ambitions and different perspective and a different mindset. He changes you from the inside out. 
This is not behavior modification, y'all, because that's just temporary. And it's also exhausting when you're trying to do it for yourself. But when God himself says, no, I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to change you from the inside out so that you can start to think like Jesus and talk like Jesus and walk like Jesus and think like Jesus. He says, I'm going to make it my business not to just save you and then leave you on your own. No, if I'm going to save you, then I'm also going to make sure that I change you. So that one day you look back on last year, two years ago, today, you look back and go, oh, that's who I was, but that's not who I am anymore. I've been changed by the grace and the goodness of God. Okay, this is one of my son JC's favorite illustrations. Have y'all ever wondered how popcorn pops? Somebody say yes. Okay, so here's the deal. Inside every kernel of corn, there's a little drop of water. So when you put the bag of popcorn in the microwave, the heat from the microwave is not heating up the shell. It's concentrating on the water that is the microscopic dot of water that is inside every kernel. And as that microscopic dot of water begins to heat up, it creates steam. The steam creates pressure and and it gets so intense inside of that shell that eventually the shell pops. And all of a sudden, what looked hard and like it could not be transformed at the beginning, becomes completely different, completely new. Stuff that was in there that you never thought could be encased in something that small and insignificant, completely transformed, not because you're concentrating on the outside, but because you're heating up what's on the inside. The patience of God is so great towards you that he begins to heat up what is on the inside. When you concentrate on developing your relationship with the Lord, he says, don't worry about the changing. I'm going to change you. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to change your desires so that things you want now, your appetite will be completely different later. I can make a formerly be stamped at the top of your resume too. But he says there's one final reason. Paul says why I want you to know the patience of God is great. He says in verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus my Lord who has strengthened me. He saved me. He changed me. But he also gives me strength. There's justification. There's sanctification. And there's fortification. He's going to give you spiritual muscle so that you can be who he has called you to be. Because it is not by strength, it's not by power, it's by the Spirit of God. And some trust in horses and other folks trust in chariots, but y'all not us. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. If you don't feel like, if you don't feel like you can hang in there, with the stuff that's going on in your life, like the stuff back at home that your friends, your roommates, your sweet mates, they don't know about the stuff going on with your your mama and them and, and the relationships you've got going on, the stuff you're struggling with in your heart and mind and you don't feel strong enough for it and you don't know if you'll ever have enough resolve and fortification to keep going throughout the rest of this semester and the rest of this school year, please hear the Holy Spirit of God say to you today, if I had enough patience to save you And if I have enough grace to sustain you and to sanctify you, please know I'm going to give you the strength and the fortification to honor me with your life and to be sustained. The good work that I have started in you, you better believe I'm going to bring it to completion. Okay, I'm going to close with this. One Christmas morning, Our little Jude, who's not really little, he's getting ready to be 14 on Sunday, and he's a giant. All the boys are giants. (laughs) Somebody come help me feed these people. (laughs) So Jude wasn't here yet. It was just the older two, Christmas morning, early morning. I think they were like three and four years old. And you know how it is when y'all, when we all were little like that, you get up on Christmas morning and you immediately want to wake up and and open gifts, get into the day. It's like 5 a.m. Your parents are like, are you kidding me? (laughs) So we got up and I'm the kind of mom that mostly when they were little, I bought them gifts from the dollar store because they were too little to know that it wasn't worth nothing. So I milked that. (laughs) 
I milked that as long as I could. And I'm also the kind of mama that if I bought them one gift that had parts to it, well, I opened that sucker up and I would take the parts out and wrap them separately. <laughs> like if it was a bow and arrows, well, they got a bow, an arrow. They, they would think they had lots of stuff. It was just like one thing from the dollar store taken apart and dismantled. But on this day, this was the first Christmas, we got them a real gift. We went to Toys R Us, which existed at the time. <laughs> we bought them this baseball machine. It was a baseball machine that catapulted baseballs out at a certain frequency and a certain velocity. The kid stands there with a helmet and a little plastic mallet, a plastic bat, and gets ready for the ball to come out so they can hit the they hit the ball. And they were so ready to go outside. It was cold. It was like 6 a.m. We have our robes on. We're putting the little thing together. We're out there shivering and shaking, waiting for this little ball to come out of this little machine, trying to be excited because it's Christmas morning. And my second son is all gregarious and all ready for the challenge. He's standing there. He's got a bat in his hand. He's waiting for, he's like three. He's waiting for the ball to come out. He's all intense. He's at least swinging at everything. My oldest son is real cautious and calculated. He's analytical. He's trying to figure this thing out. He's watching this ball come out fast and furious. And the more he sees it, the more he's like, mm-mm. <laughs> and I said, buddy, you can do it. He said, mm-mm. I said, babe, really, you can do it. It's going to be your turn in a minute. You're going to do it. He says, mm -mm, mom, I can't do that. I said, yes, you can do it, and you're going to do it because I'm standing out here at 6 a.m. in my robe, and it's cold out here. <laughs> so when it's his turn, he steps up to the plate, and y'all, he's kind of nervous because he's waiting for this ball to come out of this hole on this machine. And I'm watching my boy a little bit nervous about it, and I said, oh, man, I wish I could get his five-year-old mind to understand something and I, that I knew. Here's what I knew. His father had already gone behind to the back of the machine where there was a little gear, you, a little flap you could open up that revealed some gears. You could adjust the frequency and the velocity to match with the person who was standing at the plate. The reason why my boy had no reason to be afraid was because he had a daddy who loved him, who had already set him up to win. The reason you don't need to be afraid no matter how intimidating the circumstances of your life currently look, no matter how upside down the boat seems to be right now, the reason why you don't need to be afraid, the reason why you can step up to the beat, to the plate and be who God has called you to be in this generation, little brother, little sister, the reason why you can is because you have a daddy who loves you. He's already gone behind the scenes. He's already set you up to win. Lord, I thank you for your perfect patience. I thank you that your grace is sufficient. I thank you that your mercy is extravagant. I thank you that today is a brand new day, the first day of the rest of our lives. Change us, transform us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Well, I think that's a pretty good convo. What do you think? Well, hey, a couple of quick things before we go. Don't forget, we've got the trailer out front. If you've got a chance to go out and pick up some supplies, bring that back. I want to put that QR code back on the screen for any of our graduates who are back so you'll know what to do. But then before we go, Dr. Prevo asked me to say one thing to all of our students who are from Alaska. Where are Alaska students? We don't have that many, I know. But still, if you are from Alaska, Dr. Prevo said very clearly, do not register to vote here in Virginia. You need to vote uh, uh, absentee at home. And he said something about a permanent fund, and he said, don't be stupid. So that's for our Alaska students. God bless you. Have a great day. Show up at the game tomorrow. It'll be a great day.